Well, let us now please stand for the reading of the written word. Let us hear then the written word from the Old Testament, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your land and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Micah 4, 1 through 5. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of armies has spoken." For all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. Psalm 86, 9. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. To the New Testament, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Acts 2.38-39 And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Acts 16, 31. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God and the world did not know God, through wisdom it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So far the written word. Our God, we pray that you would, by your Spirit, grant to us better understanding of your revelation and to recognize that this gospel is a worldwide calling and we are privileged to be a part of the ministry of the church to bring the word of Christ to the, to the nations. And we ask in all these things we should go forth with bold confidence because you've made the promise you will be with us to the very end of the age and you will draw the nations to yourself. May we therefore not only believe but confidently act on this command by faith for your name's sake. Amen. Please be seated. The Reformation was a restoration of truth. There had been great corruption that had occurred because it is man's natural tendency, including ours, to soft pedal what God has said, to deny or reduce the number of commands that bind us while at the same time expecting more and more from others. And so 
It has been the nature of man always and everywhere to elevate himself and to reduce others. And this is really idolatry. In idolatry, you don't want to hear the true God. You instead create for yourself a God that is more palatable. But of course, these idols actually wind up becoming tyrannical and dominating over you. But yet you still feel more clever and you can manipulate them. And so the offerings and sacrifices that are brought to idols are to manipulate them to get what you want. It's always for your personal advantage and often for the destruction of your enemies. There isn't prayers that I'm familiar with in paganism where you sacrifice to your idols for the good of others. Unless it's, of course, your, maybe your kin or something like that or for your emperor, but not for your enemies. You always desire more for yourself and less and less for others. And that is human nature. But it's not natural human nature. It is fallen human nature. Now, what will change us? Well, there's Buddhism or Stoicism where you simply just deny wanting anything. You seek to have no desires anymore. But then you also cannot love. So that's certainly not good. There's other attempts where, you know, like with economics, where the selfish interest of an individual actor in a system of law will also promote the good of others because you have to provide goods or services that benefits others. But again, this, that's only for living for the moment. That is hardly a uniting theme that guides us towards greater glory. It is only the knowledge that God, the God who is, the God who made heaven and earth has loved you and has loved you when you rebelled against him, has loved you in such a way that in order to restore fellowship with you, he would pay off your debt of sin. He would take on his own wrath upon himself and shed his blood to deliver you from death to everlasting life. And this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the God who has been sinned against, the God whom we continue to sin against, continues to extend to us love, grace, and mercy. Why is this important to understand? Because the unfortunate tendency of man, pride-filled, is to say that I will find a way of peace with God, and that will be through my becoming better. I will try to think nicer thoughts. I will say nicer things and build up others, and I will do good deeds. In all this time, expecting that we will be able to shift the balance by doing more good than whatever wickedness we have done in the past or we still tend to fall into. And so this is that whole idea of religious karmic balance where you try to change it so that it goes 5149 on the side of good and therefore you're kind of, you have to be blessed. But when we understand that every sin is against a God who is majestic, holy, magnificent in every way, and we sin against people who are made in the image of God and we cannot undo them, then we realize there is no hope. And this idea of doing good, of course, better to do good, but it's not going to cancel out the evil that we have done. And there is no hope ultimately in these ways. But the gospel of Jesus Christ comes and says, I will make the payment. I will deliver you from death to life. And what is expected of you when it says believe, unfortunately, they often speak of accept Jesus Christ. Not the worst idea, but when that's the primary way of thinking of our relationship to Jesus, it misses the point. Jesus says believe. Believe that God has loved you. Believe that God has made provision. You're not accepting Jesus you're recognizing the reality of the love of God worked out in Jesus Christ. And that's very humbling. And so one of the things I like about the Reformed understanding, the Reformed explanation of Scripture and the Christian faith, is that we don't say, when someone asks, how do you know you're Christian? You don't say, I've accepted Jesus Christ. What does the Catechism say? I belong to Jesus Christ who has purchased me with his own precious blood. It puts the work on God. It shows how it is gracious. It makes you thankful. You're no longer trying to impress God or others, but you are announcing that you have been loved in such a way that God would take on flesh and die for you. And for this reason, the Reformed were able to rightly understand Scripture. 
because they were no longer approaching it with that selfish, idolatrous way that is still seeking glory for man, but rather now comfortable with the knowledge that they completely undeservedly have been loved by God, they were able to understand and let the word of God speak rightly, which announces God has loved. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. God wrote our names in the book of life before creation. God is the one who purchases us. God is the one who sent his spirit to regenerate us. God preserves us because he purchased us. So you see, Reformed theology is not the result of academic arguments. Rather, it is the comfortable reception of the revelation of God. So we have been looking at particularly five points on justification in the canons of Dort. Now, people will call this the five points of Calvinism. That is actually an incorrect thing to say because what people often term Calvinism, again, it's an insulting term. It's not meant to be a compliment, um, but it's not a bad thing to be called. After all, John Calvin was a very faithful minister of the gospel and we rejoice in that, but we don't worship Calvin, nor do we think he was sinless. He announced he was not. What we are affirming is that we believe God has spoken regarding how he has redeemed men. And these are five points that had been brought into dispute by the Arminian party who were falling back into the old Roman Catholic ways, which are pagan ways of thinking, whereby the creature finds a way to mend his relationship with the deity by some sort of work. And... Reformed theology, rather, announces what God has revealed about how God restores fellowship between the deity and the creature, between God and man, by his work. And as we said, it starts with God looking upon a sinful race, electing some, delivering them, preserving them, well, regenerating them, and then preserving them. So now we are looking at limited atonement. This is the most controversial of the five points of Calvinism. This would be the L in TULIP. And it is unfortunate that that particular phrasing has stuck because it's not limited atonement, but rather definite atonement. That's the better way of thinking of it. Limited seems to imply either a lack of power or an inability on the part of God to do something. Definite actually announces that it fulfills purpose according to the design of God. What do we mean? Often you will hear John 3.16 read as though it is a universal appeal that Jesus died for each and every person, but they need to make a move to receive the benefits of Jesus' work. So rather than, I belong because I have been purchased, it instead is, God has opened a way and I must walk through it. It takes the focus away from the grace of God and puts it back on the work of man. With limited atonement, definitive atonement on the part of God by design, we say that those whom God purchased, he made payment for them. And because he is just, once payment has been made, they are delivered from death. And because the method of deliverance was that you'd be united to Christ, you obtain all his benefits. So the limitation that we speak of is not due to the limited power of God, the limited value of the blood of Jesus Christ. The limitation is in the will and design of God for the sake of his own glory that he does not choose to elect everyone. We already saw that when we looked at head one. So it is God's election that limits the work of Jesus Christ, though the value of Christ's sacrifice is more than sufficient, as the theologians used to say, for this world and 10,000 besides. We have no question or doubt about the infinite value of Christ's death. The question is, what was the design of God? And the design is that he would bless the nations through the seed of Abraham, who is ultimately Jesus Christ, and he would make purchase of these peoples. And we will see more of that. But now, here's the thing that we often come to. People will look at Reformed churches and Calvinistic churches, which founded the modern missions movement, and say, we don't believe in evangelism and missions. That we are actually lazy and we don't believe in telling the world about Jesus Christ because since God has elected only some and God will definitively send his spirit to them, 
We don't need to worry about it. Well, what makes reformed, reformed, and as I said, even if they try to slander us as Calvinists, insofar as we actually look at Calvin's example, he let the word speak and convict him. And so we receive from God what he has said. And when God says, it is by my electing love that some are saved and not others, we accept that. And we also accept when God says, go out into the world and make disciples, we do not reject that command. We do not say, well, logically, we know that the elect are going to be saved. We don't have to worry about it. We don't do that. Rather, we see the command of God, and because we receive all the word of God, we also then support missions and evangelism and do it ourselves. And so Article 5, even those looking at the doctrine of limited atonement, notice the Reformed theologians, what did they do? They inserted this to make it clear by speaking of election and limited atonement, the definite atonement of the work of Jesus Christ, we are not therefore saying evangelism is unnecessary. Rather, Article 5, Moreover, it is the promise of the gospel that whoever believes in Christ crucified shall not perish but have eternal life. This promise, together with the command to repent and believe, ought to be, must be, announced and declared without differentiation or discrimination to all nations and people to whom God in his good pleasure sends the gospel. So, We are saying, when we speak of these things, we are not using them as an excuse for laziness or our failures. We announce what God has said because God has said it. Let the chips fall where they may. And so we believe what God has said here. Genesis 12, the Lord, Yahweh, tells Abram, give up all earthly methods of building wealth, power, prestige. Leave your land, your kindred, your father's house, And now, by faith, trusting in me alone, go to where I will establish you. Because you're not going to be part of the old kingdom of Ur. You're going to be the establisher of a new kingdom, which is the kingdom of God, which is founded on faith in Christ and not in the abilities of man. And when you go, you will become a great nation and a blessing. And those who recognize that you are my servant and are thankful to God who bless you, I will bless Those who will not see or enter the kingdom, because they are not born from above, I will curse. And we already saw in John 3, it's because they are already under the curse. Micah 4, this is also in Isaiah chapter 2, this is what God says about the continuing work of the kingdom. Starting it off as Abram's family, becoming ultimately, you know, Israel, and finally the house of David, leading to Jesus Christ. In the latter days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains, lifted up above the hills. So far, so good. Every Jew would have liked that. But then the prophecy says that the temple will be defiled. People shall flow to it and many nations shall come. Well, remember, for the Jews, only the 12 tribes were around allowed in certain places. Of them, only the tribe of Levi could go into certain precincts. Of them, only the priest's family, and then finally, only the high priest once a year into the Holy of Holies. And so the idea that we'd be opening this up to the nations would go against the character as of Judaism as they might have, in fact, still practice it. But from the very beginning, God had always said, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And here the prophecy says, in the latter days, many nations shall come to this mountain, which will be established as the highest of mountains. Now, we do not believe that there's going to be some tectonic event that's going to raise up Jerusalem to be higher than the Himalayas and to Everest. No, rather its station is elevated by virtue that the Son of God has called this place His It is elevated in station, not in elevation. But what's so remarkable is that it's not a geographic locality because the house of the Lord is actually Christ's body, which is the church. And so nations from all around the world are flowing to Jesus Christ and because of Jesus being elevated to heaven above. The prophecy, of course, is given in a shadowy form. We know its fulfillment. But notice the prophecy. God, through his prophets, said that the nations will be blessed 
by returning to Yahweh, coming to be taught his ways and walking in his paths, confident that the word spoken by God is from heaven itself and it rules us. And God will be the judge of the nations or the ruler of the nations, deciding for disputes and transforming us from those who are selfish and who loathe others and desire our advantage over them, rather to be a people who are content with what we have, setting aside our weapons and our animosity and living at peace because we are confident that God gives us all things. All things work together for good. By verse 5, it speaks of the peoples, the nations, walking in the names of their gods, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh, our God. And then you can see from the Psalms, Psalm 86 speaks of the nations that God made shall worship him and glorify his name. So why is it then we who speak of predestination and definitive atonement, Speaking of that, there is a body of people called the reprobate. Why do we evangelize? Why do we support missions? Because we know that God has chosen from every tribe, tongue, and nation a people to be his own who will come rejoicing to belong to the family of God, to the kingdom, and bringing glory to his name. Now, turning to the New Testament, we see that we are told by Jesus himself Go and make disciples of the nations and make them to be marked out as removed from the kingdoms of this world, from Babylon, and now becoming pure citizens of my kingdom, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And though they come from different traditions with different philosophies and different languages, I expect you to teach them. And I will make them willing to hear and learn so that they may know everything I have spoken, all that I have commanded you. But don't go out fearful. I will be with you always. And by my spirit, I will bring this to conclusion because I made the promise to Abram that the nations would be blessed through him. Through Micah, I have revealed the nations will come to me. There's no way that a man can guarantee that the nations will come and become those who live at peace with one another despite all of our differences, but it is God's promise to do this. And he says, by his power, it will be done. And the word we will announce to the whole world is that in this way, God loved you. And God will open up their hearts and minds to understand, to see these things and to believe that those who rest in Christ Jesus have obtained an everlasting inheritance. Peter announces with the promise given to Abraham when the sign of circumcision was given. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, into the name of Jesus. This is not only for your benefit, the forgiveness of your sins, but for your children. And then he adds, and for those who are far off. Abraham was given the sign of circumcision for himself. It was the adult faith that was now marked with the sign of circumcision, the promise by God that I will bless your family, that sign of adult faith was given to the infant child. But again, it was restricted there. It didn't go to the nations. But now we are told the promise is for you, it's for your children, and for the nations far off. Well, how can this be? Because God intends to accomplish it. And how does God intend to accomplish it? By sending us out to proclaim the gospel to the nations. And then you see there in Acts chapter 16, a non-Jewish family is told they obtain all the blessings. And so when the jailer in Philippi believes, it's not only himself that he saves, but rather we are told his whole family is now marked out from the rest of the world. And that's why they are given the sign of baptism that very night. Thereby God demonstrating, I continue to work. And the work that I do is so efficacious, so beautiful, that I will start with the Father, but it will extend to the family and then to the nations. But as Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, don't think that this is going to be by your cleverness. Whether you are wise, the debater of this age, understand, the world doesn't want to hear this. There was a minister I was listening to and he, he, he said, like, it's, it's unfortunate that we lead many people out there and say, hey, just go out, tell people about Jesus, and they're going to come to know him. Now, yes, God by his spirit will cause many to know. But he said, if you go back and look at the old cartoons, like this is like 1800s, early 1900s, 
you always have those images of the big pot with the missionaries being boiled in it by the cannibals. He goes, that was not out of nowhere. The world does not naturally want to hear about Jesus. The world naturally clings to its idols. Understand you are going to a hostile world where they feel that we are fools. But in spite of that, what does Paul say to the Corinthians? But to those who are being saved, Jesus is the wisdom and power of God. So we're not going out with this power expecting everybody we speak to is going to believe. Everybody is going to hear and respect us. Not at all. The world sees and believes that we are fools. But to those who are being saved, the power of God goes forth in the preached word. And so we do reach out to Jew and Gentile, to people all over the world, knowing that this foolishness of preaching is the wisdom of God with power. And it brings people to life. And they believe in Christ because they've been purchased by him and they rejoice in this. So, Reformed theology is simply a desire to understand God as God has revealed himself. That's the big thing. We're not trying to be distinct. We would rather there not be a Reformed church separate from others, but rather a Christian church that all believe the same thing. And that is simply what God has revealed. And that's why we have our confessions. That's why we proclaim these things. That's why we guard the pulpit and we don't let just any human opinion enter it. That's why we try very hard not to allow politics or current events to be part of our preaching because it is the mind of God that you need to be hearing. And that means humbly receiving all that he says. Not only that he is one God, that he saves by grace, that it is all by his election, but if he also commands forgive even your worst enemies and pray for them, we understand that's a command to us. When he says, go and proclaim the gospel to the nations, that's to us. So the reformed of all people should be the most servant-like, the most humble, who want to hear the word of the king and believe it and obey it. And so that's why, even when we're speaking theologically of who, for whom, did Christ die? What is the worth and value of the death of Jesus Christ? Knowing that this would be an objection raised, our theologians made it very clear. We expect the church of Jesus Christ to take the gospel to every nation without differentiation, without discrimination, knowing that this is God's good pleasure for the nations to be blessed through the seed of Abraham jesus christ so just to be clear when we are accused of being lazy that might be a personal guilt that we have but it is not a fault of reformed theology reformed theology is not dependent on what others say we should think that is one of the most obnoxious things you will run into is people say well if you're reformed then you believe x like no i'm reformed Here's the book that says what we believe, that our church teaches, that we openly proclaim. And here you have it. In the older translations in English, it actually spoke of promiscuously, without any restriction, that you take this gospel out there. And now it speaks of this must go out without dif uh, differentiation or discrimination. It's more clear, but it kind of loses that punch of that word. But understand, we do believe that it is the duty of Christians and the Christian church to take the word of the gospel everywhere. The doctrine of election and definite atonement do not curtail us from our work, but rather, rather give us confidence. Because if they have been purchased by Jesus Christ and his blood is of such great value, those whom he died for will not be lost. And therefore he says, I am with you always even when you got into the world, and when the debater of this age, the wise and the scribe mock you, don't worry about it. There's power in this word, and it will save many. Let's pray. Our God, we pray for your spirit to truly give us a spirit of humility, that we would want to know and understand you the way you have spoken and revealed yourself. As we know you more, May it have its proper effect, giving us even deeper humility and love 
So we ask, O Lord, to know that our calling is to bring the word of the gospel to the nations and to do so with zeal starting wherever we find ourselves, but supporting the work to the ends of the earth. And we thank you, Lord, for this gospel which was brought to us that has given us life. Amen.